Hello, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Ray Johnson, and um, I'm going to be doing a presentation on managing non-scaffolding trades on, on scaffolding, or rather, really, what you shouldn't do on scaffolding, which is really where we're going to be coming from. So the main issues really need to be is that people that use scaffolding always assume that scaffolding is safe. They assume that it's been erected by competent scaffolders, and they assume that the scaffold has been inspected and passed safe. As you probably know, some of you in the construction industry, this isn't always true. If the scaffold isn't right for some of the users, what they tend to do is get a spanner, move the boards, try and make it right for them, rather than going back to the scaffolding contractors to get it changed. And the biggest problem that we have is people removing braces, removing ties, removing inside boards. And in addition to that, the next biggest problem is overloading it. Everybody thinks the scaffold can take an infinite amount of bricks. Now, one of the things that you'll see with this presentation this morning is that I'm relying very, very heavily on photographs, because photographs speak 600 or 1,000 words, which I need this morning because I'm struggling with my throat a bit. So you'll see quite a few photos, and we can get those through for you and see what we can learn. For people that have been attending these presentations this week, you'll probably hear quite a lot about the Milton Keynes class, because I think about three or four of us are actually using it in our presentation. For those that don't remember, it's a scaffold collapse that happened back in April 2006. It was a collapse, a major collapse of scaffolding, not all of it, a partial collapse. We had three workers with multiple injuries, and one of whom who died three days later. The HSC said that if the scaffolding had been designed, erected, and managed properly, this is an incident would never have happened. One of the problems that we had was that people were interfering with the scaffold, people were taking ties and braces out, it wasn't designed properly, and the biggest problem was people were overloading the scaffold at that time with a load of tiles, and all those things together caused all the factors of safety to go and the scaffold to ultimately collapse. So there's a few pictures that I've taken on my travels over the last, uh, well, over about the last 18 months, actually. All these are relatively new. This is one that we looked at in, uh, in Nottingham. And if you look at the um, chimney, what looks like a chimney there, there was a coping stone on top of there. Now, the scaffold users were actually went on that scaffold. It was a combination of an independent scaffold and a putlot scaffold. It had been erected very, very poorly. They, as scaffold users, didn't think about the loading of the scaffold. They thought it was very difficult to get a 250, 300 kilogram coping stone down from the top of that chimney onto the scaffold and down to the ground. So they thought that the best way of doing that was to just push it off onto the scaffold, 300 kilograms, drop it about 10 feet onto the scaffold, and they didn't seem to think that had a problem. Uh, well, unfortunately, it did and uh, that's the collapse that transpired. You can see a car in the right-hand corner there. Quite interesting, that, because the guy that actually pushed it the last little bit, that's his car that the scaffold landed on. So a bit of poetic justice, I think, there. For those that are in the know on scaffolding, one of the things that you will see, that is a putlot scaffold. Now, we should have the, uh, the first lift. In other words, the first horizontal member of that should be in it no more than two metres high. At a pinch, 2.7 uh, metres, if it was on a, uh, on a shop front, which it wasn't, those, that platform was actually put in at 3.8 metres high, and it wasn't tied to anything. So that's why you know, things like that actually go down. So what is needed? What do we need to think about? Well, the first thing we need to do, as a company employing people on, on scaffolders, is employ a competent company, for instance, an NASC member company. Not going to go into details because that's been covered already. We need to think about the scaffold design. Does it need to be designed or does it not? We need to make sure that the scaffolders are trained to CISRS standards, or if you're putting up aluminium towers, to PASMA standards. And just one thing, a CISRS trained scaffolder with 35 years' experience and all the scaffolding training in the world is not confident in putting an aluminium tower unless he's been trained and done his plasma card. So just make that quite clear. And vice versa, of course. We don't want somebody who's been trained on plasma trying to put a, a scaffold up. 
you need to make sure the scaffold is handed over, handing over inspection, and it's inspected every seven days. Well, what about the users? They should be really asking the questions for their own personal safety as to whether those things, are they confident that their company has made sure that those things are happening? Has it been put up properly? And one of the things I'll talk about right at the end is have the users got some awareness of scaffolding so that they can actually recognize when something goes really bad? But the most important thing for a user is they mustn't alter the scaffold. They mustn't take anything out of it. They mustn't take anything, putting anything else into it. One of the common ones is putting a pair of steps on the top lift of the scaffold. As soon as you do that, you're above the, you know, the protection of the guardrails, for instance. So let's just look at some of the things that people do. Now, we all understand that people have to dig trenches on a construction site, but directly under the main structural support of the scaffold ain't a good idea if you're actually going to go up onto the scaffold. Very, very common. All that we're asking you to do is if a user is wanting to do that, communicate with the scaffolding contractor and he can adapt the scaffold to make so you're allowed to do that. Okay? But you need to talk to him. Don't just go ahead and do it. This is a, probably a classic one. Um, this ladder was in a proper ladder access position, but the users of the scaffold decided that they wanted it to be somewhere else. And not only is it almost impossible to get on, almost impossible to get off, but as you can see, the whole weight of whoever's going up that ladder is actually supported on the rung of a timber ladder. So, you know, there's so many accidents waiting to happen. And access and egress to scaffolds is a very, very big issue. One of the things that we always look at, you should always use the staircase as a preference and then go down the hierarchy from there. Well, this is off the scale as far as at the bottom of the hierarchy is concerned. The other problem that we have is users of scaffold or people that need to work at height create their own platforms. The picture on the left there was actually taken quite a few years ago. Um, that was when we were doing a lot of auditing in Southern Ireland. And that was very, very common of their construction industry in those days. Everybody using anything that was lying around. That's a 13-foot scaffold board. And by the way, a scaffold board is designed to be supported every 1.2 meters or 4 feet. At that kind of level, a scaffold board doesn't give you any warning when it's gone. It just goes, and you're down. And what's he falling onto? In Nottingham, two years ago, we actually had somebody falling off a improvised platform onto starter bars, and he was impaled on starter bars. I haven't, got a, I haven't actually got the picture on that, but I wouldn't show it today, because you can imagine you don't need a picture to show that. The picture on the right, in actual fact, wasn't the house owner, it was a local builder. And um, local builders, being local builders, think that all the health and safety rules don't apply to them. Well, I've got news for them, they do. And if the HSC had seen this, it, there would have certainly been taken some action, prohibition notice immediately anyway. I've got a number of pictures on this particular job. Um, as I walked around from the car, the first picture I actually took was him halfway up an aluminium ladder that was not set out as an aluminium step ladder, but just leaning against to get to the top of the, uh, to, to the, top of the building. Absolutely crazy. You can see he's tried to put some braces down there, but uh, I think you would agree they are not designed as part of the scaffold system. And that type of scaffold system doesn't comply with what we're, what we're doing anyway as far as the work at height regulations are concerned. The guardrail heights and the way to get up it are just not suitable. One of the other things that we have, this is quite an interesting job. I was inspecting this scaffold myself a few years ago, and the previous week the scaffold was absolutely fine because the building came up to the edge of the scaffold. And then the contractors decided to take the building away, and uh, when I went down and said, I want everybody off there, you can't work it, they said, well, why not? I said, because you've got no edge protection. He says, that's nothing to do with the scaffold, it's nothing to do with your inspection, so therefore we're not taking any notice of it. Honestly, that's what happened. So uh, I made a little phone call and somebody else organized it, shall we put it that way around. The other thing about moving boards or making your own platforms, on the right-hand side, somebody had actually, I mean, these boards aren't suitably supported anyway, but the guy that's actually there that you can see his legs, he was actually working on that job. He was using compressed air tools and he didn't seem to think he'd got a problem with a four foot gap in front of him with a four lift um, fall down to ground level. The guy on the right 
the fall wasn't as high, but he shouldn't be doing that. If he wants a platform there, he needs to get the scaffolders to put a proper platform there for him. This is quite common as well. People pinch the inside boards on a scaffold because they want to work near um, an internal staircase. Just remember what I said before on the Irish picture. The maximum span of a scaffold board is 1.2 metres. Those are considerably more than 1.2 metres, even if they have doubled them up, and it is not a safe working platform. So those are some of the things that users are actually doing on scaffolds. Getting back to probably, again, as I said at the beginning, one of the biggest problems is overloading, particularly on house building jobs, particularly on the table lift right at the top. Commonly, this lifter scaffold isn't adequately tied. The problem with tying this lifter scaffold is you've got green brickwork, and unless you put your rakers in, it's very difficult. And what they'll do is they'll put every single brick and block that they need to put that gable end up onto that scaffold, okay? And it's overloading it. So you just need to look out for that. The other thing that you need to look out for on overloading is quite a serious one. Um, a lot of the house builders now are putting up birdcage scaffolders, uh, scaffolds um, as crash decks. Um, first of all, can I just explain one thing? There is no such w word in scaffolding terminology as a crash deck because a crash deck implies that something is going to fall on it and scaffolds are not designed for that. You can have a protection deck, but not a crash deck. It is a birdcage scaffold. It is generally 0.75 kilonewtons per meter squared, so that really means 75 kilograms per meter squared. On that area there, I actually, in fact, I took that picture three weeks ago. The amount of blocks on there overloaded the scaffold just over by 11 times what it should have been. And if you can see, you can't probably see in the picture, but those scaffold boards are bending. And if that collapses, the whole lot goes back. And if somebody's underneath when it goes down, you know, you can have a major, major accident on your hands very, very quickly. So something to, to watch out for and um, just be aware of. Ties. I have got lots of pictures with ties out, but, you know, showing you a picture of a scaffold on the floor, even with somebody lying against it, doesn't mean anything unless you can actually see where the ties are. So I thought I'd do this a slightly different way. There's two pictures there of good ties as far as the scaffold is concerned. What a lot of the major contractors are doing now is that they are requiring scaffolding contractors wherever they put a structural tie to put a tag on it to say, do not remove. And in the inductions for the workers on those scaffolds, if they are caught removing one of those ties on two of the companies, and I won't name them, not only are they banned from that site, but they are banned for life, forever working on one of those sites ever again. Okay? That's how seriously they take it. Okay? One of the things that we need to think about with those uh, tie tags, those tie tags don't just go on where you've got drilled anchors. They go on when you've got through ties through windows because those are the ones that are more likely to be removed. Where you've got rakers on, the only place you don't put them on is a corner return because that's, that's part of the scaffold. But if you've got a raker, you need to put this structure is part of a tie, do not remove. And really what a lot of the good practice comes down from the major contractors, the smaller contractors can learn from it. Red hot off the press last week. We have safety gates on now, pre uh, preventing access or preventing people falling through a gap where there's a ladder access. I don't know if you can quite see it, but somebody's taken a brick tie and bent it and actually lodged open the safety gate so they don't have to keep opening it and closing it when they're coming up and down. Might be more convenient, but that gate's there for a reason. It's a safety gate, so it needs to remain closed. Sometimes, when you go on a site, the users need to turn around and say, no, we're not using that scaffold. There's a scaff tag on there. Scaff tag or any kind of tagging system is a way of letting users know whether the scaffold is safe. Now, what that tag says to me is, from the staircase, that scaffold is safe. Getting to it, you're taking your life into your hands. And that was in the middle of Sunderland on a major bank. Uh, absolutely incredible. And I think um, the last one that I've actually got as far as horror pictures are concerned is housekeeping. The same old thing on, on all scaffolds, keep the area clear because otherwise people are trying to, not only are you overloading the scaffold, but there's all sorts of things in the way and people are putting themselves at risk trying to get around it. 
So just in conclusion then, two more very, very quick slides. Just stop and think about this do not use scaffold. Do not use scaffold, what does it mean? It means do not use scaffolds. I went on a house building site the other day. It had seven of these signs on, including at all the accesses, and there was 22 bricklayers working on that scaffold because they were behind time. They should not be there. If the scaffold's not being handed over, it's not safe to use. So we need to get those messages over. So what do you need to do? Work at height, scaffold appreciation training for users maybe. Certainly site inductions and toolbox talks to users of scaffolds on the safe use of scaffolding. Check that the scaffold's been uh, inspected ready for use in every seven days. Follow the signs, for instance, the scaffold tagging system or a do not use sign. And whatever you do, do not modify the scaffold. And the last slide for you, um, what can the NESC do to help? Well, the NESC have lots of guidance notes. And one of the most recent ones is this one, the unauthorization, or, sorry, unauthorized modifications to scaffolding. And that will show it's got different slides in than the ones that I've been using, but it will point you in the right direction. And not only um, are you able to get that from the NESC, but it is free. But you do have to send them an email to request it. So if you take notice of the, of the email address, or if you want to see either myself after this talk or anybody else on the NESC stand, we will give you the email address and they will send you one by return. So uh, the NESC contacts are on there, as you can see. Uh, the website, put it on your favorites, please. Uh, it's a really good uh, website, lots of information. And thank you very much for, for listening. And as I said, I will be available if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards. Thank you.